Cathedral Ward is the heart of the city of Yarnum and the seat of power of the Healing Church. But as we'll see in this episode, the religious iconography and architecture of Cathedral Ward is an elegant illusion, hiding a dark truth. Under its sprawling churchyard facade, Cathedral Ward was designed as a prison. Once we defeat Gascoigne in the Tomb of Eden, we're able to proceed to Cathedral Ward. A cutscene welcomes the player to the first of two structures named for houses of worship. We begin our journey here, in Uden Chapel, and our quest line in this area ends within the stained glass walls of the Grand Cathedral. It's easy to let these sanctuaries of Cathedral Ward and the district's bounty of sacred statuary frame our conception of the area. But if we're observant and intentional about not letting the religious connotations of Cathedral Ward cloud our judgment, we start to see some unusual details, some of them glaring, some of them subtle. Let's start with two of the more obvious details, then we'll zoom in on the items that are easy to overlook. From Eden Chapel, we have two pathways at our disposal. Regardless of the exit we choose, we quickly encounter the main type of enemy of Cathedral Ward, the Church Servant. In our first playthrough, encountering this enemy can be fascinating and alarming. Unlike the beastly creatures we've come across thus far, the church servants are towering ghostly figures with dark, dead eyes. For now, it's not really important to wonder what these creatures are, whether they're Thumerians or something else. It's the aspects of their design that are key. There are slight variations in the design of the different church servants, but we encounter two iterations of servants regardless of the path we take in Cathedral Ward. One is hooded and carrying a staff, the other dons a wide-brimmed hat and carries a staff and a lantern. A bell can be found hanging from the necks of both servants. These details are giveaways, letting us know right away that the church servants are based upon the night watchmen or bellmen of the 17 and 1800s. The night watchmen became a fixture of urban settings in Europe and the British Isles in the 11th and 12th centuries and remained part of city life until the 19th century. Although we wouldn't consider them law enforcement by today's standards, the watchmen patrolled city streets and sounded the alarm in the event of danger, be it crimes or, much more importantly, fires. Watchmen were sometimes simply called bellmen because they would carry a bell and let it ring out when disaster struck. I've seen many players speculate about the significance of the church servants' bells, assigning them a spiritual value or tying them to the beckoning bell or other bell items in the game, but I don't think it's that complicated. I think they're just intended to symbolize the bell of a night watchman. Lightly armed, the watchman wasn't a deterrent to criminal activity, but the role served as a sort of precursor to more formalized policing practices that were adopted in the 18th and 19th centuries. In Great Britain, the first professional police force was the Bow Street Runners of London, formed in 1749 and shown here in a photo taken around 1800. The runners would phase out after the formation of the London Metropolitan Police Force in 1829. While watchmen aren't a perfect analog for law enforcement, I still think this is what we're supposed to see when we examine the church servants. Most of the church servants act as patrolling constables, walking designated paths through Cathedral Ward with a lantern and polearm or some other sort of weapon, as if they were walking their beat on city streets. But as we make our way up the staircase to the Grand Cathedral, we come across two unique servants who aren't found anywhere else in the game. They're armed with what are known as a gibbet or gibbeting, an item synonymous with capital punishment. A gibbet can be a gallows from which a person could be hanged by the neck, or it could be a cross for crucifixion, or even scaffolding to hoist a cage in which victims would slowly die of either starvation or exposure. These church servants also have a unique impalement attack during which they lift the player off the ground and appear to receive the same invigoration effect that the hunter does when performing a visceral attack. Thanks to their all-black attire, their impalement attack, and their gibbet-like weapon, these church servants seem a lot like executioners, or perhaps maybe black-robed magistrates who could sentence a man to death. Taken all together, the church servants in their various forms appear to represent the entirety of the Victorian justice system, from the patrolling constable to the magistrate or executioner. These features alone certainly don't indicate to us that Cathedral Ward is a prison. 
but it helps us reorient our thinking and get us in the mindset of viewing this area from the perspective of crime and law enforcement. To take the next step, we can look at another more easily discernible piece of evidence. When we exit Uden Chapel and attempt to explore Cathedral Ward, we're stopped in our tracks fairly quickly. We discover that the ward is locked up tight, sealed by two large metal gates. We learn that if we want to get inside, we'll have to find a way to sneak in or we'll have to obtain the right security credentials. If we're willing to spend the blood echoes for it, we can purchase the Hunter Chief emblem, which grants us access through the main gate of Cathedral Ward. The Hunter Chief emblem specifically states that the main gate to Cathedral Ward is shut tight, as if the player wouldn't notice this obvious fact. It's almost as though it's being emphasized to draw our attention to it. Additionally, the title or position is interesting. The emblem belonged to the chief, a title given to the highest ranking law enforcement officers, be it a chief of police in the United States or a chief inspector in the United Kingdom. These details that the gates are shut tight and only the emblem of the chief will grant us access inch us a little bit closer toward this idea of Cathedral Ward as a prison. Ironically, it's the small details on the biggest figures that help us see this prison connection most clearly. Let's turn our focus to the church giants. It's easy to assume that the church giants are simply oversized versions of the church servants. They have similar ghostly faces and long, lean limbs. They wear wide-brimmed hats as well. But the church giants are not at all like the church servants if we look closely. First, pay attention to the condition of their clothing. The shorter servants are by far the most well-dressed of all humanoid enemies in the game. Their hats are crisp and well-shaped. Their clothes are perfectly fitting without a wrinkle, stain, or tear. The church giants, by contrast, are bruised and bandaged. Their clothing stained and in tatters. The edges of their hats are fraying. Whereas the servants' bells are hanging from their neck on a slim leather band, the giants' bells are crudely attached with a ruddy chain tied to a length of rope. If the church servants are modeled off the night watchmen who ultimately became modern-day police, the church giants are the sick prisoners of the Victorian era. Again, let's focus on the details. When we look at all of the giants, whether in Cathedral Ward or in the cavern beneath Yosefka's clinic, we can observe shackle rings around their ankles. The axe-wielding giants in Cathedral Ward make a loud clanking noise as they slowly traipse around the grounds. This implies the sound of chains that would bind their legs together. There's also a unique giant in Cathedral Ward not far from where we obtain the monocular. This giant wields what players often refer to as a wrecking or demolition ball, but it's not. It's a prisoner's ball and chain attached to his wrist. He just happens to use it as a weapon. We find further evidence that Cathedral Ward is meant to represent a prison when we're able to access the circular plaza at the foot of the Grand Staircase. Two church giants walk the grounds here, and a large monument stands at the center of the plaza. It took me a long time to see the relevance of this area. It struck me as odd that From Software took the extra step to mention this area in the item description for the Hunter Chief emblem. The item specifically named this area as the Round Plaza Leading to the Great Cathedral. I was finally able to put a few clues together, and then it clicked. This space is modeled off the Panopticon, a prison design concept by Victorian-era philosopher Jeremy Bentham. The Panopticon would allow a single guard to monitor dozens if not hundreds of inmates from a central station or tower. If we ascend a building on the edge of the plaza, a top-down view helps us to see this comparison a bit more clearly. I'd understand your hesitation to embrace this comparison, considering it might seem like I'm basing it only on the fact that the Panopticon is in the shape of a circle and this is a round plaza. But there are two additional details that sealed the deal for me. First, as shown in this image, there's a lore note that we can read while overlooking this Panopticon area. It reads, A watchman of Bergenworth guards the gate with a password, the sacred adage of the Grand Cathedral. Finding a note here, which we'd have to read while overlooking this area, that includes the terms watchman, guards, 
and gate is no mistake. The language of this note is designed to orient our perception of this area and associate it with watchmen or guards, as in prison guards. Second, when we return to the plaza after the blood moon, we find the church giants seemingly asleep. In our panopticon circle, the two giants are kneeling at the outermost ring. I never thought anything of their positioning until I came across images of Jeremy Bentham's panopticon design proposal. The giants are found in the same posture that prisoners would have been expected to assume during mandatory sacred services, kneeling in their cells along the outer ring of the panopticon, which we see here. The panopticon was never built, but the philosophy that drove its design strict isolation of all prisoners and heavy doses of religious reflection took root in the United Kingdom and the United States in the late 19th century. The juxtaposition of religion and punitive incarceration are palpable here in Cathedral Ward. You might be wondering, why would Cathedral Ward be designed as a prison, staffed with watchmen and populated with towering inmates? For that, we can thank our main influence for Bloodborne, William Ernest Henley. As we discussed in the last video, which explored Hemwick, Henley spent two years at the Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh in the 1870s. In the book of poems he composed about his surgery and recovery, Henley described the Royal Infirmary as half workhouse and half jail. As we saw in the previous episode, Hemwick shares many characteristics of the Victorian workhouse, while Cathedral Ward is much more like a jail. As I've said before, the life and works of William Ernest Henley are the soul of Bloodborne. Something we haven't yet discussed in this series seems appropriate to bring up now. It's a question I asked myself repeatedly during the research and analysis process for this series. Why did From Software decide to make it the Healing Church? It seems strange considering the other organizations within Bloodborne were designed as academic in nature, such as the College of Bergenworth and the School of Mensis. Why then would Lawrence's institution receive this unique religious identification? Eventually, I learned the answer. It's because Henley did it. As I just mentioned, and as I laid out in Part 6, the Healing Church was based on the Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh. Unlike Bergenworth and the School of Mensis, which were inspired by the evolution of medical research at the University of Edinburgh Medical School across the pre-Victorian and Victorian era, the Healing Church wasn't based on a place of learning, per se. It was based on a place of healing, the Royal Infirmary. But the Healing Church's religious connotations almost certainly go back to William Ernest Henley's literary work. Throughout the 28 poems of In Hospital, the diction Henley applied to his care providers at the Royal Infirmary was laden with religious simile, adjective, and analogy. The terms he selected included piety, religious, pray, Jesuit, faith, Philistine, hymn, saint, rapture, Quaker-like, pious, and catechist. In Henley's telling, his nurses and physicians may as well have been ministers and sisters of a healing faith. From Software's decision to call it the Healing Church and setting its headquarters in Cathedral Ward makes sense. The term ward can mean a borough or district of a city, but the term is more commonly applied to hospital departments, such as the maternity ward, the burn ward, or the trauma ward. Because the Healing Church was based upon the Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh, one of Scotland's leading hospitals, the term Cathedral Ward seems even more relevant. Earlier, when I referred to the church giants as sick prisoners of the Victorian era, I didn't explain why I used the term sick. Now that we've established that Cathedral Ward was inspired by the prison hospital description of Henley, we can take one final look at the church giants to see how this comparison was executed in the game. While the faces of the church servants are sallow and ghostly, their skin is smooth and their eyes are dark but visible. It's completely the opposite with the church giants. Their skin is distorted with pockmarks, their eyes deeply sunken to the point we almost can't even make out their eyeballs. They seem ill. I believe the church giants are meant to represent hulking versions of lepers. 
Leprosy is an old disease that can cause severe lesions on the skin, as well as distortion of extremities and facial features. For thousands of years, societies responded to leprosy with fear and ostracism. In the Middle Ages, hospitals focused on housing and treating lepers emerged throughout Europe and may have helped set the stage for the development of modern hospitals of the 18th and 19th century. Despite the gradual improvement in care for people suffering from leprosy in the Middle Ages, exclusion and distrust were common. Lepers would be required to carry leper bells, signaling their presence to others. Based on the design of their skin, their facial deformities, their hats, and their bells, I believe the church giants are being depicted as prisoner patients of Cathedral Ward. Before we conclude, I wanted to take a brief look at Eden Chapel, which technically is a part of Cathedral Ward. In this episode and the previous video, we focused on how From Software used Hinley's description of the Royal Infirmary as half workhouse and half jail in creating Hemwick and Cathedral Ward. Eden Chapel, oddly enough, seems to tie into this comparison as well. We have the option to send four individuals to the chapel, technically five if you include the suspicious beggar. Like the needy people who ended up in workhouses because they had no place to turn, our guests at Eden Chapel ask us essentially the same thing. Do you know somewhere that might take me in? Might you know of a safe place? Do you know of any safe places? Would you know of any safe havens? Tell me about your little safe place. Moreover, each person represents a class of people most likely to end up in a workhouse or prison in the 1800s. They include Ariana, a prostitute, the suspicious beggar, who was a beggar and a murderer, Adela, a mentally ill woman who, under the right circumstances, is a murderer, the narrow-minded man, a duplicitous layabout, and finally, the lonely old woman, who is a lonely old woman, but is also a drug addict. No, for real. She's an angry old lady who carries the consumable called sedative, which is undoubtedly a depiction of chloral hydrate. Chloral hydrate was the first major medical sedative to be produced, coming on the scene in the 1830s and slowly gaining popularity over the next half century. Chloral, as it was known, was employed by physicians to calm patients who experienced behavioral abnormalities associated with mental illness. Not surprisingly, it was used liberally within insane asylums before it became more widely prescribed for what we might now consider generalized anxiety disorder. According to the sedative item description, it calms the nerves so that one doesn't fall to madness. Madness seems to be referring to mental illness, and thus the sedative refers to chloral hydrate. By the late 1800s, chloral was a drug available to the masses in Europe, Great Britain, and America. It's a powerful, highly addictive drug. The lonely old woman will give some of this drug to the player character after she's started to mellow out, implying she's been sampling some of her own sedative as well. Drug abuse among the elderly wasn't unheard of in the late 19th century, especially as access to opium-based drugs including laudanum and morphine became easier over the course of the century. So yeah, party on, lonely old woman. In the next episode, we'll take a look at the ways in which the city of Edinburgh and Victorian artwork appears to have shaped the features of central Yarnum. The first thing we see when we set foot in central Yarnum should have been a dead giveaway that this is Edinburgh.